Okay, fantastic. So thank you very much. So I, okay, so, so I will make, I will give this lecture in English. I I sort of wanted this to be in English because I expected uh, that that there might be some people who do not really speak Polish uh, attending our meeting, as it happened uh, as it happened on multiple occasions before. So I sort of aimed for this lecture to be to be uh, accessible to us as many people as possible. Um, and what we are going to to talk about today, and this is actually a, a, I'm really happy that we that I can I can share this research, uh, our research with, uh, with with our society and with all of you, because what we are going to talk about today is uh, something that is unbelievably controversial, and I deal with the controversial. The controversial is my daily life. Uh, I work uh, I work on multiple projects from from the search for life on exoplanets from from the alternative biochemistry type of, uh, of research, even to drug design. And all of those topics that I work on are to some degree always controversial. Um, and what, what this particular research with that we are going to, that I'm going to present to you today is about, is about our recent discovery of phosphine gas on Venus, uh, which uh, got uh, quite a bit of a, of a media coverage uh, in September when the research when this research got public, mm, and essentially, and essentially since then, since then actually uh, steered the the pot of scientific uh, of astrobiological research quite a bit. So what we are going to talk about today is we are going to go through essentially three parts of this uh, of this research. Uh, first is uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the discovery itself. And uh, and uh, observational astronomy. Well, I am not an observational astronomer, so forgive me if I am not going to be able to, in detail, uh, answer your questions about that aspects of the of the research. But we also are going to talk about uh, potential implications of this um, of this uh, discovery, and we are going to to touch also on the astrobiological potential of Venus because this is something that also um, well, it's quite controversial, but also that captures imagination of many, many people uh, all over the world. Uh, because as I would try to argue, Venus is not beyond the scope of interests uh, of astrobiology, and we should look at this planet in more favorable, uh, more favorably when, when we actually try to understand the habitability of planets or even, uh, the, or even, uh, or even uh, you know, when we look for life uh, elsewhere outside Earth. And finally, at the very end, I will touch a little bit on the on the possibilities of actual uh, space exploration and uh, and the missions uh, and uh, and missions to Venus or some concept studies that that we also are involved uh, currently in. But before we dive into into the the very core of the controversy, we have to know what is the object of this uh, of our study. We have to know why Venus is such an interesting place, and we have to have some sort of or general, um, general idea what the planet is. So Venus is often called a sister planet of Earth. And this uh, might, sound, uh, sounds, uh, might sound like a, like a reasonable assumption, but only essentially if we look at the, at the overall um, physical properties of it in terms of mass or radius, yes, those two planets are, are quite similar. We might, say, we might say quite the same, but there are other uh, other features of this planet that are that are actually that of those of both planets Earth and, and Venus that are actually completely different, and that that mm, that makes those uh, those two planets very distinct and not sister-like at all. And in particular, we have a very high difference, the very significant difference in surface temperature on Venus. Uh, actually, at the very surface of the planet, we have uh, temperatures re reaching 465 degrees Celsius. This is, of course, a temperature that uh, is completely uh, hostile. Well, I mean, uh, completely incompatible with any com any any kind of complex uh, organic chemistry. Maybe uh, maybe except some some boring Teflons or something like that. Also, the surface pressure of, of, of Venus atmospheric pressure is it's much higher than on Earth. It's 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 approximately ninety times times higher. So the planet, it, it, the planet essentially is, it's also quite, quite different when it comes to the actual chemical composition of the atmosphere on Venus. Of course, the main constituents of the atmosphere are carbon dioxide and nitrogen. 
On Earth, of course, we have nitrogen and oxygen. What is also quite important is that Venus, Venus um, at the first glance, looks extremely boring because it is covered, completely covered, in permanent cloud cover. So there are clouds on Venus that cover this, they are permanent and they cover the planet absolutely completely. And this cloud cover uh, is actually also chemically very different uh, than the cloud cover, than the transient cloud cover that we have here on Earth. On Earth, the clouds are made from uh, liquid droplets of water. On, the, on, the, on Venus, the clouds are made from, at least that we, what we think, are made from concentrated the liquid droplets of concentrated sulfuric acid. And this cloud, cloud cover is essentially um, also quite, quite temperate in terms of the temperature of the, of the cloud cover, but of course not in terms of the uh, chemical, uh, chemical uh, environment there. So, but we have to be aware that uh, Venus is also, that the atmosphere and the Venus in general and the, and the environment on Venus is, is quite chemically complex as well, because the, if you look at really carefully at the composition of the atmosphere of Venus, you will see that, okay, there, are, there is carbon dioxide and there is nitrogen that are the main constituents of the atmosphere, but there, is, there, are, quite a, there are quite a few, a lot of different molecules and gases um, that are actually in trace amounts in the, in the atmosphere of Venus, and they actually add to the, to the complexity and mystery of this, of this planet quite a bit. So we essentially, know, so we have an atmosphere that is also quite comple chemically complex. Welcome back. I'm sorry, I don't know why, but, uh, but my, uh, I got kicked out from my own Zoom that I host. So, <laughs> so I don't know why it is. I hope that this is not going to, can you hear me now or okay? Yes. Yes, can, you also see the, can you also see the, the, the screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Yes. Um, apologies for that. So apart from this chemical composition of the atmosphere that is quite complex, we also have, as I mentioned, this complex cloud cover that, is, that, is, that, is, that we call the temperate zone. And of course, this temperate zone is, is, uh, is temperate only when it comes to the temperature and pressure conditions that are, that, that, are, that, that are there. The temperature is between, let's say, approximately 80 degrees Celsius to zero in the top clouds. And the clouds, as I mentioned, are actually quite, quite, quite harsh in terms of the chemical composition because they are made of liquid uh, sulfuric acid. So recently, we have added a new mystery to this, uh, to this uh, complex uh, chemical picture of the atmosphere of Venus because we have discovered, discovered a phosphine gas in the atmosphere of Venus in exactly in this temperate cloud zone of, uh, of Venus. So, what is phosphine? Uh, phosphine is essentially a gas that contains a phosphorus atom and three phosphor and three hydrogen atoms. It is so it's so its overall formula is it's uh, PH3. Yes, it is a gas that is actually quite very quite very interesting because on Earth it's only it is also present in as a trace constituent of an atmosphere on on Earth as well, and the only sources significant sources of phosphine on Earth are biology and in the human industry. So on Earth, the phosphine is produced exclusively in oxygen-free anaerobic conditions by oxygen-free and anaerobic bacteria, of course, uh, in environments, for example, like various, like marshlands, uh, uh, marshland swamps, or it is even, uh, even detected uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, in guts of various animals, including, including humans. Um, so that's why this assessment or this, this, this association of phosphine with biology on Earth uh, was actually uh, why we also were extremely uh, surprised that phosphine was detected on Venus. But it is quite important to, no to note that the observations of Venus uh, and search for phosphine in Venusian clouds that was done by Professor Jane Greaves from the University of Cardiff was actually 
um, was actually uh, astrobiological in its inception. So the reason why Professor Jane Greaves was looking at Venus was genuinely to look for biosignature gases in the clouds of Venus and phosphine was one, was, was one such gas that she looked for. Because we have to be aware that the, that the idea or the hypothesis that the Venusian clouds might be, in, might be actually uh, inhabited or uh, by some form of, form of life is not a new one. And it is, it was floated, it is floating, uh, it is floated in the, in the, in the literature for, for decades now. So, so Professor Jane Greaves studied phosphine and study, and tried to observe phosphine uh, in the Venusian clouds completely independently from us. Um, we didn't know about each other until she contact, contacted us because we were interested, we, our group at MIT, we were interested in phosphine uh, purely from the theoretical standpoint as a potential biosignature gas in atmospheres of exoplanets. And apparently we were the only, the only group, the only expert group uh, that looked at phosphine from the exoplanetary, atmospheric, and uh, astrobiological and, uh, and planetary in general uh, perspective. So the sort of a holistic astrobiological and exoplanetary point. And so, so, so she reached out to us and we sort of joined forces and, and looked at the, at the, at the phosphine on, on Venus um, uh, together. So what she was able to do is she essentially did, is looked, used two different telescopes. One is the JCMT telescope from, on Hawaii, and the other one uh, was uh, the other one is Alma in Chile. And to uh, to her amazement, we, we were able to actually detect uh, two. We, we were able to detect a single absorption line of phosphine. In the millimeter uh, wave range of the wave of the of the spectrum, both with GCMT and and with Alma uh, together, so that was actually extremely surprising for us, and well, it was also quite exciting because we will then have to understand first of all if this detection is really really real, and secondly, what really what chemical processes could potentially produce produce this uh, new molecule in the in the Venusian atmosphere. So as I mentioned, we, Professor Jane Gives was able to actually detect the signal that comes from phosphine with two different facilities. One is from JCMT, which is essential, and one is ALMA. And this is in, uh, in, uh, in all cases, a single, single uh, line, that single signal that comes, that, that can be ascribed to, to phosphine. What is quite interesting is where this signal comes from. What is the distribution of pH3 of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, because it looked because the, so the, so in terms of the altitude where phosphine was detected, it is actually the, the signal appears to come from the from the height or the altitude of around 55 kilometers above the surface. So in this temperate and again temperate only from the point of view of the temperature temperate region of the clouds of Venus um, uh, of the clouds of Venus here. The abundance of phosphine is a separate story that is still being um, sort of um, explored and assessed, but it is in the parts per billion range. What is also quite interesting that our initial observations with ALMA suggested is that the, the distribution of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus is not only vertically, it's, it's not only differs vertically, so it is in this, uh, at the height of around 55 kilometers in the clouds, but it's also geographically uh, distributed um, also in, in, a, in a special or a special pattern, so to speak. So we, uh, initially with ALMA, we, weren't able, we, di we didn't detect phosphine signal in the polar regions of the planet, but rather the phosphine signal was sort of localizing itself uh, in, the, in, the, in the mid latitude regions of the planet exclusively. And that was actually in itself quite interesting. Interesting, interesting in itself. Now, I'm going a little bit ahead of myself here, but I think that this is a good way of uh, putting this new information in. Um, this distribution pattern is probably not absolutely accurate. What we, what we now have um, after months of, um, of various feedback and and some calibration corrections, we realized that the new ALMA data that we reprocessed, that Professor Jane Grief reprocessed with other ALMA, ALMA personnel, it appears that the phosphine 
phosphine uh, signal is still approximately around uh, parts per billion range, but the distribution of phosphine is likely likely in a patchy patchy way. So there are probably some patches in the in the in the atmosphere of Venus that actually are phosphine rich richer than 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 the others, and that in itself is actually quite interesting as well. We have also some um, evidence of potential time variability of the of the phosphine signal as well, but this is still all um, all work in progress. So it looks like the phosphine um, the phosphine uh, distribution is actually quite complex. At this is and this is probably going to be studied quite a bit uh, in the future as well. What what is quite important to to note is that our uh, our research sort of sparked a really really accurate really really detailed analysis of the of the data and uh, and ALMA processing and thanks to that also they were able to to correct some calibration errors in their in their code for in for ALMA so essentially now uh, now the observations with ALMA are generally improved not only for us but in generally for community as well i believe so there is an obvious question yes with such a sort of unexpected discovery that uh, that nobody sort of uh, expected to happen. Nobody expects phosphine to be to be present on a rocky planet um, like Venus. Uh, the obvious question is: Is the detection real? And and in our original uh, original uh, paper, we did uh, a multiple te tests for to to actually uh, confirm that the detection is real. Well, first of all, we have the phosphine line absorption that has been seen with two independent facilities. We have this phosphine detection with both JCMT and ALMA as well. We also did a, a phosphine, um, and we also see that phosphine line measurements are actually consistent under varying and independent processing methods. And also if you overlap the spectra from two different facilities, you have no other such con consistent negative uh, features, the signals that you could ascribe to. To to, to 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 phosphine or other to, to other some errors for example so there are also there are no other known reasonable candidate transitions or, or 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 signals or lines that 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 could be the other molecules for example that could mimic this phosphine signal so it could be that okay maybe if the signal is real then maybe this is not a phos not phosphine but something completely different and one of such molecules uh, to, to, that we looked really carefully at is um, sulfur dioxide because the sulfur dioxide might in certain cases might potentially mimic the mimic the same uh, signal and might be confused with uh, phosphine and finally at the, as a robustness of the entire detection professor jane greaves actually was able to detect um detect an expected uh, expected absorption line from a deuterated water so we wouldn't, were able to detect a molecule that we know is in pro, is in the atmosphere of Venus. We know how it behaves. We know we know its abundance, and we were able to to actually detect the um, the, the molecule, these molecules, this this control molecule, so to speak, with in the right abundance, uh, and with and and get the get the signal from that molecule also with the same procedure. But of course, this was the original how the original data was 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 presented to the community. Since our initial uh, discovery, of course, the archive essentially exploded with, uh, with various papers that were, um, that were either critiquing our, our discovery or commenting on it or, or following up on various, uh, on various claims from, from our original paper. And people try to look at the at Venus and look for phosphine uh, in infrared. And they were in, able, to, and able to put some sort of stringent limits uh, on the on the abundance of phosphine, this is above the clouds. Yes, so this is not in the clouds when, when the phosphine was detected with our observations, but it's mostly focusing on the above clouds detection with uh, with um, with um, infrared. And they put some very very clear, uh, very very stringent constraints on the abundance of phosphine above the clouds. Um, and uh, and we will also discuss that later in the in the in the paper in the in the presentation uh, if we have time. Now some people were claiming that the that the discovery of phosphine is com is completely wrong. So in a sense that the, there is no signal whatsoever. So that there is no statistically significant detection of phosphine whatsoever, and that the that there is no no evidence for this uh, molecule in the abs uh, in the in the atmosphere of Venus whatsoever at all. And some people 
were claiming that there might be there might be a, there is a signal let's say from JCMT telescope, but it, it it's it's that, that it can be identified or explained by uh, by sulfur dioxide, but not by uh, by phosphine itself. So we have since then uh, we have uh, submitted and our our own replies, and this is of course I always say we, but in this case uh, it was it was of course uh, with the work of Professor uh, Jane Greaves and the observational astronomy team, and we essentially replied to to those uh, criticism uh, in detail. And, uh, and you are very welcome to actually look at our replies and, and also the, the original critical uh, articles. And, uh, and you are welcome to actually um, assess, uh, assess the quality of our responses and the quality of the critiques on your own. But the very rough uh, summary of, uh, of, um, of, the, of the critiques and our replies can be, can be essentially presented in the following way. We can essentially critique the discovery in two ways. We can ask the question, is really the, the phosphine line or the phosphine signal real? Or maybe this is actually a, an artifact of the, of the data analysis, for example. And we address, this in, in, we address this in, in quite, of a, quite of a detail. And we can say that there is some sort of misunderstanding between the, our critics and us, because our PH3 identification was not a post hoc rationalization of a feature found after this complex uh, data processing. In other words, we, we predicted where the line is, and so any fake signals that we actually were, that we actually could get in principle had to be present at a pre-specified clear location. And we were able to actually assess how likely it is that we could get a fake signal like that. And we tested this with the with the methods with our methods and the fake the, the, the probability of a fake signal in this case is on is below two percent. This is also this critique stems also from the point of view that people were looking at various uh, various um, ways of analyzing or processing the data, which which involves various high order polynomials, and that there was a lot of discussion about that. And we also actually show that with that pre-processing, it does not create the artifacts that people were worried that those uh, that they can they can actually uh, happen. And for the record, we absolutely agree that if you do not use this method correctly, or if you do not use this method carefully, you will be able to generate you will generate quite easily fake signals. Yes. So you do not, but you have to. You can use it, you can use these polynomials, high order polynomials, if you actually use it, the, use it carefully and guide it, so to speak, and not use it as a hammer that is sort of applied blindly throughout the data, but as a precise tool. And Professor Jane Greaves actually explains this, um, explains this in detail in our replies. But polynomial, uh, polynomials or not, we, she also developed a non-subjective method of characterizing the data sets. So essentially we can depart completely from the polynom usual polynomial procedures and you, can, and you can still recover the line. So essentially you can have multiple methods of data analysis and you still get the signal back from the data. So that is, that is quite encouraging. So you can then ask a question, okay, if the signal is indeed there, then can it be something else than phosphine? Can it be sulfur dioxide, for example? And well, we don't think that people, as people suggested, some people suggested that, is, uh, that the line, that the signal is actually a sulfur dioxide and sulfur dioxide is a common component of the Venusian atmosphere. We believe that it is actually not likely for this signal to be sulfur dioxide, simply because for example, the sig for this to be sulfur dioxide, the signal would have to come from a much deeper regions of the of the atmosphere, and this is uh, and this is in this case uh, not the case. It's not the it's not the right temperature range in the clouds where we saw where we saw the signal for for this signal to be to, to come from sulfur dioxide. To sort of explain it in a very simple simple way. Um, first, second of all, of course, the sulfur dioxide signal or line 
is close, but it's not sufficiently overlapped with the phosphine line. So they are there, so there is this uh, uh, discrepancy in spectral position, which is quite important uh, for us to, to also um, note. And second of all, and for thirdly, I would say, uh, both ALMA and JCMT lines are essentially too wide for, to be sulfur dioxide, which are normally uh, the normally very narrow for sulfur dioxide. So essentially, from that point of view, this also doesn't really fit very well with the sulfur dioxide explanation. There is a caveat here that we are assessing the level of SO2, SO2 contribution in the new reprocessed uh, data from ALMA still because uh, because this is this is not yet uh, this is actually quite time consuming and we still don't have this 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 data fully um fully available but also there is an abundance issue because you would need twice the maximum level of so2 uh, seen in years of this type of observations uh, for for this to be actually so2 yes and you would still have the width and position discrepancy so this is actually quite unlikely as well. But of course, I, I understand that probably the discussion is this line there, is this processing the good, or this is or is this SO2 or pH3 uh, is going probably to, to take years to disentangle because we have to be aware that, for example, the analysis of Martian methane is uh, still dragging for uh, 15 years uh, after the initial discovery and people are still arguing is there is methane on Mars or not. So I don't believe that we are going to settle this discussion um, anytime soon. But nevertheless, it is quite important to realize that not all of this deluge of papers that arrived at archive after our discovery was public was critical or negative for us. Because there were certain papers that, uh, uh, that came out from the group of Professor Rakesh Mogul that had a very interesting idea. Uh, essentially, Professor Rakesh Mogul from California asked a very interesting question. Let's look at the data, at the legacy data, the data that were collected by various probes very, very long time ago, and let's reanalyze it and see what those data carry in it. So essentially what we could actually squeeze out of those data now, uh, today, uh, sometimes 40 years ago, 40 or decades decades uh, later in the, in the future. So one such data that Professor Rakesh Mogul actually reanalyzed was the data that comes came from a neutral mass spectrometer from the Pioneer 13, uh, Pioneer 13 uh, probe. So the Pioneer 13 probe con con uh, was, was designed to actually look for the, cons for the components and uh, com the composition essentially of the gaseous components of the atmosphere of, uh, of Venus. So, so essentially it, con it, co it carried this neutral gas mass spectrometer on board and it was looking exclusively at the gaseous components of the atmosphere as it descended through the atmosphere of the planet and as it actually descended through the cloud decks of Venus as well. And what Professor Rakesh Magul was actually able to, to, to see, and I highly recommend those papers in a sense that they are very distressing because they not only provide some evidence or hints that NASA detected phosphine 40 years ago and in the clouds of Venus and didn't know about it, but also many other potential weird, uh, let's call it like that, potentially weird and interesting chemical, uh, chemical constituents of, of the atmosphere of Venus that uh, essentially shouldn't be there. But going back to the, to the phosphine conundrum, the evidence for pioneer Venus reanalysis are the following. The, in the mass spec data, mass spec spectrum from the, from the pioneer probe, uh, Professor Rakesh Mogul was able to actually pinpoint ions that that could come from some sort of phosphorus containing gas. And those ions uh, actually correspond to the ions that you would actually in principle uh, have if you had phosphine gas, neutral phosphine gas in the, in the atmosphere of Venus. Of course, some of those ions are possible to confuse with, for example, uh, hydrogen sulfide, but there is one particular ion, which is the P plus ion that cannot really be uh, confused with, uh, with any, anything else. And it essentially has to come from some sort of gaseous, gaseous uh, phosphorus species. And that is quite interesting. Um, this data also come from the measurements from the middle of the cloud decks of Venus. Um, so, it's ex so it's sort of maybe a little bit below when we actually, when Professor Jane Greaves was looking at the, phosphine, uh, at the phosphine signal, 
with her observations. What is quite worth to note is that this work is also done together with uh, Professor Richard Hodges, who is one of the original science, uh, scientists and engineers behind the neutral mass spectrometer on the Pioneer probe. So he is one of the, so to speak, expert in this type of technology. Professor Hodges, as far as I remember, as far as I know, is 90, uh, 93, maybe 93 years old, and is still active scientist and still still um, still does uh, does does quite a bit of uh, planetary uh, uh, instrumentation and research. So, what this could be, uh, what this phosphorus uh, gas uh, uh, species, or what this P plus ion could be, actually. And if analysis of Professor Rakesh Mogul is true, then it essentially could be PH3, of course, because this, because this is a gaseous product. Well, it is the simplest gas that feeds the data. There are all these ions that, that, that we have uh, identified in the, in the Pioneer Venus uh, data. And this feeds the data, of course, from the, from the Pioneer probe. But it is, of course, extremely controversial, isn't it? Now, you have also uh, other potential gases products from, from from uh, that contain phosphorus, it is PH, P, P, trichlorophosphine, or I don't know what's the, what's the name of it, PCL3, let's call it like that. It's the simple gas, but there are all kinds of problems with it. And uh, to sum it up, uh, it's essentially not, go, not good uh, evidence uh, for, uh, for the, um, not good experimental evidence for it to be, to be it. Uh, there are some other ones that are also quite, uh, quite exotic like elemental phosphorus. This in principle could be a good candidate that, that would explain this ion, but it's in the temperature regime again when the, when the actual measurement was done, it's not really good for, to, to good for explanation of this, uh, of this, um, for this gas to be, to be a source of this, of this ion. So you could always ask a question, okay, what if there are some uh, oxidized phosphorus species that could be in principle have some sort of water, uh, some sort of a vapor pressure on, on in the, in the in the in the clouds, and maybe they they actually um, are detected uh, by the mass spectrometer, and then essentially what, that they are the source of this uh, P plus ion. Well, it, the oxides of phosphorus cannot be sampled by the by the by this type of instrument, and this are this is due to the engineering parameter of the of the actual instrument. There might be maybe some some uh, phosphor oxidized um, phosphoric acid vapor, but this again is not really supported. By the, by the data themselves. So what is the conclusion from all of this? Is that if this reanalysis of the mass spec data from the Pioneer uh, from 40 years ago is true, then the middle clouds of Venus actually contain some sort of phosphorus gas. And the pH3 is the simplest gas that feeds the data. Yes, so that is, that is, uh, that is pretty clear. And uh, so this is also the one thing which we, we, we then one moral of this story is also that we have to look uh, very carefully at the data that was actually collected many, many decades ago, because there might be some information there, which we could have easily missed, as it was with this pioneer, uh, pioneer reanalysis as well. And what is quite interesting is that the data from the pioneer probe was made public as far as I remember, after our story was uh, published. Yes, so NASA made public this made public the pioneer data only after the Venusian Venusian uh, Posfin story was was public. So it is quite important that we should actually re re reanalyze some of the old data because we might actually potentially learn something completely different and new about the planets that we visited a long time ago. So under the assumption that the phosphine signal, that the signal is there, that the phosphine is indeed there, then we have to ask ourselves a question, what process actually makes phosphine on Venus? What chemical process is responsible for making it? Because we have to be aware that uh, we, I mean, we, essentially the answer to that question is very simple. We have no idea. I mean, it is, it is absolutely unknown what process could, have, could, could be responsible for the phosphine production on Venus. We shouldn't expect this gas to be, pre to be present on a rocky planet like Venus um, because it shouldn't be there I and mean, it shouldn't be produced at all. Uh, phosphine is produced quite efficiently on planets like on gases, plan gas, gas giants, so to speak, giant planets like Jupiter and, um, and Saturn. But the reason why those 
planets are actually why those planets contain phosphine is because the phosphine production there is extremely favorable due to the three factors and essentially a very high temperature in the depths of the of the atmosphere of Jupiter, very high pressure and very high abundance of hydrogen. In this case, none of those three conditions are met on the planet like Earth or, or Venus. And therefore, phosphine production on those rocky planets uh, is not is not that uh, is actually so such so so unexpected. You might think, okay, Venus has a has a temperature that is pretty high, or the pressure surface pressure that is pretty high. It is those are temperature and pressure regimes that are not high enough for this process to be to be actually uh, favorable. And of course, there is a famously hydrogen depleted environment of Venus that is actually extremely depleted, even if, if compared to Earth. There is also another problem with this phosphine on Venus, uh, uh, pro problem for, the, for its production. Because if it is, if it is indeed produced, <coughs> excuse me, then the process that produces it has to be, uh, has to be efficient enough because phosphine is actually not a gas that is sort of um, chemically inert. It is a gas that is extremely reactive. It is reactive both with other uh, constituents of the atmosphere, um, on, of Venus in this case, but also photochemically uh, unstable. So it is, it, is a gas, it is a gas that if not replenished constantly in the atmosphere, it will get depleted, it will get destroyed. So it has to be constantly, constantly produced to maintain this, um, this abundance in the atmosphere of, uh, of Venus. So it shouldn't be there at all. So there has to be some sort of process that makes it. And we, just, and we looked, okay, this is also uh, work of my, uh, of my friend, uh, uh, Dr. William Baines, that essentially we looked at various, various processes that could produce phosphine on Venus. And if, if for example, phot photochemistry destroys phosphine, so maybe photochemistry can also produce it, produce it, produce it, produce it and we looked at various photochemical pathways that could, in principle, lead to the formation of phosphine uh, in the atmosphere of Venus. And there are some complicated chemical networks. You are welcome to analyze this yourself and, and read the papers that we published on this. Uh, the point is that essentially this is uh, not good enough because the, the production, the efficient, the, it is the production of phosphine this way is not efficient enough to explain the abundance of phosphine, even in the parts per billion in the atmosphere of Venus. So if, 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 if photochemistry cannot really produce it, then maybe there are some other chemical reactions that could in principle involve various phosphorus species and then produce this uh, reduced gas, the, phosphorus, the, pho the phosphine. And we looked at various, various chemical, uh, chemical uh, reactions between various atmospheric gases, various surface minerals, or even minerals that could be in principle transported as dust to the Venusian atmosphere. And nothing seems to, seems to produce phosphine uh, at all from the point of view of, of course, uh, thermodynamics, yes. And we also looked at various cases in which, uh, in which phosphine is not produced directly by a chemical reaction, but phosphine is produced as a result of, uh, for example, the composition of some intermediate species as it was, uh, as it could be, for example, using the, uh, in the case of the phosphorus acid, H3PO3. So essentially you could post produce something that then leads to the formation of phosphine in a different, in a different, con uh, in, in, in some other um, conditions. So uh, often, often the, the example of that reaction is, for example, some taking some phosphorus oxides, reacting them with water, and then you have this phosphorus acid that then could, is, is generally unstable at higher temperatures, and it could for, uh, lead to the formation of phosphine. The problem is that if something works uh, on a, if something works on earth in the laboratory condition, or if something works on Wikipedia, it doesn't mean that it is going to work on Venus. And this is this is something that that uh, that um, uh, that we should also look 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 at very carefully. So we always look at those chemical reactions in the context of the of the complex environment that we, that we have on Venus uh, it's, itself. So this doesn't doesn't work as well. So if this doesn't, if all of those chemical chemical reactions do not really uh, produce phosphine. Then maybe there are some physical processes that could, in principle, produce it. Maybe there are some chemical reactions that happen underneath the surface of the planet. And for example, maybe phosphine is produced volcanically or um, or through some subsurface processes. And we rolled this out also extensively. So volcanoes are unable to produce enough phosphine. Only trace amounts 
and those are not enough to produce um, ex enough amounts of phosphine that we observed, even if we invoke some, for example, a little bit exotic minerals, like for example, reduced uh, mineral um, metal phosphides. This is just for illustration purposes. This is an, a figure of uh, copper phosphides. Of course, there are some other phosphides, and this is just uh, just basically for 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 showing you what what type of minerals we have in mind. Those are also not. Um, they provide, no, there is not enough of them to actually explain the formation or the, the abundance of phosphine that we have. In general, the volcanic activity has to be approximately 200 times higher than we have on Earth to end the Venus would have to have very water rich mantle for this phosphine to be actually volcanic. So this is quite unlikely as well. We even assumed that Venus could actually have tectonic activity, which there is absolutely no evidence for and maybe through tribochemical processes, so tectonic shear, for example, you could produce some reduced gases like phosphine, and this doesn't work as well. Lightning, all the same problem. You do not have enough of it, even if it is on Venus, which is, again, a very, com com co very complex and very controversial issue. You only produce trace amounts, so it's not enough to explain the amount of phosphine. Because what we have to be aware is that we are not only looking for a process that could produce phosphine, but it has to produce phosphine in sufficient amounts to explain the observation. So you could ask, are the sulfuric acid droplets an environment in which phosphine can be produced? Well, the complex chemistry of sulfuric acid is not exactly something that people study all the time. So the answer to that question, it might be actually quite complex, but it is unlikely because sulfuric acid actually oxidizes phosphine, it destroys its quasifs quite efficiently. And they are even industrial processes known from 140 years or so that are using sulfuric acid exclusively just to remove phosphine. It is such an efficient way of, of removal of phosphine. But of course, sulfuric acid chemistry and various species dissolved in them is quite complex. So of course, um, this might be some sort of weird unknown chemistry. And hopefully, we are, going, we, 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 we are going to shed some light on that aspect as well. So if you cannot produce phosphine on the planet, maybe you could deliver it from outside. What if you actually have meteorites that have some phosphorus-containing minerals that could bring the brick phosphine, and, um, and this could be the source of phosphine? Well, not necessarily. Even if you have these reduced minerals of phosphides, which I mentioned, this is still not enough. You also do not have, you also cannot do this with a comet, comet hit if you have one big chunk of icy, rocky material. There are no uh, signs of that and not really a, 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 a sufficient explanation for phosphine abundance as well. And of course, there could also be some very, very exotic ways of producing various molecules, including solar wind, excuse me, but this is not also good process to make it. So we have this extremely long paper that is hundreds or so papers. And this is a basically a laundry list of various, pro why, why, various of those various, why those various processes cannot be the source of phosphine. And this leaves us uh, in a little bit of a conundrum because it looks like phosphine, if phosphine is indeed there, then it cannot be produced by conventional processes that we know from, uh, from, um, from rocky planets. So we don't know what process makes phosphine on Venus, if indeed the discovery of phosphine is true. Uh, this leads us to, an imp to the implications. If phosphine is indeed produced by some non-biological process, like for example, um, photochemical, an unknown photochemical process, unknown geological process, or some other atmospheric process that we don't know of, then it means that our understanding of rocky planets is in general extremely uh, severely lacking. This is possible, of course, and uh, we don't claim that it is impossible. This actually is an extremely interesting, exp extremely ex interesting possibility because this would expand our our understanding of the geology of at atmospheric chemistry or photochemistry of various rocky planets quite quite uh, significantly, mm. and it might lead to to a completely different understanding of, uh, of rocky planets and the fact that maybe rocky planets are actually much better chemists than we expected them to be. But of course, 
there are there is another uh, rather uh, rather crazy and controversial hypothesis that this phosphine on in the clouds of Venus could be a could be a result of biological process or bi some sort of biological process. You might ask, okay, this is absolutely crazy hypothesis, um, but is but is it actually possible? Is it in principle possible from the let's say uh, biochemical point of view? Um, it is because life on Earth uh, does it. Mm, it is life on Earth, the anaerobic biosphere, as I mentioned, there are bacterial or microbial species that are capable of actually going through this very, very uh, difficult re uh, reaction of re reducing, uh, reducing phosphine. And they are capable to, of doing this. I will not go into details here because this is somewhat of, a, of an ongoing research, uh, but um, uh, figuring out what exactly biochemical, what, what is the exact biochemical mechanism in which uh, life on Earth does it, it's, it's an active area of our interest as well. Uh, because this is actually unknown after after decades of studies in that area, people are still cannot cannot really understand how life exactly does this. But in principle, life could do it and does this on Earth. But and this is where we are going into crux into the, of the matter, so to speak, or a crux of the con of the biological controversy as well. Is it even physically possible for life to make it to make phosphine? Or even exist in the cloud in the cloud uh, cloud decks of Venus, because we have to be aware that Venusian cloud environment it's nothing it's it's not at all like any it's it's completely different than any ecological conditions or any ecological habitat environmental habitat that we have here on Earth. So there are absolutely no parallels between any inhabited place here on Earth and the Venusian, Venusian cloud, cloud conditions. So we cannot just say, oh yeah, we have some extremophile that lives in sulfuric acid conditions somewhere on Earth in, in, in some conditions, and then therefore this, this, this microbe would survive in the cloud decks of Venus. That is a stretch. And that, that is, so this is important to point this out very early on because we cannot simply transfer our biochemistry to sulfuric acid and expect it to, to, to function or expect life to survive there. This is illustrated very simply by a very, very simple experiment. If you take sugar and you add the sulfuric acid to it, you just basically chop it into, the, into pieces and, 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 and you essentially have this carbon, amorphous carbon sludge as a result. So the direct transfer of what our life does, our biochemistry to sulfuric acid is impossible. So where does it leave us? Well, we have to realize that the environmental challenges for life in Venusian clouds, and this is of course a hypothesis. We do not claim that phosphine is a, pro, is a proof of any uh, uh, life because it is of course not. Uh, but if there is anything alive in the clouds of Venus, then it has to face challenges like no other life here on Earth faces. First of all, there is this question of concentrated sulfuric acid that I already, already mentioned, which is much more acidic than any, any other acidic place on Earth, including the Dalol pools in Ethiopia or an iron mountain in, in California and so on. You also could have, in principle, very high energy requirements for that, for that life. But this is not a big, big deal, probably, because if you assume that some of this life is actually photosynthetic, then you might take, have some uh, ways around that. Uh, but nutrient scarcity might be a problem. Uh, we have to be aware that in each case, this life would have to permanently reside in the atmosphere, in the cloud decks, without the contact of, with the surface that is absolutely too hot for any, organic chemi any complex organic chemistry. So it is an analogous situation. So it could be, for example, that, that some of the elements or some of the nutrients, like for example, the non-volatile ones, uh, are, in, uh, are extremely scarce, like for example, metals. We don't know that, but there might be a limitation for life at all, in, uh, it's quite severe, severe limitation for life in general. This is an analogous situation to a degree, this nutrient scarcity, and I stress the word analogous because the environments are of course completely different, uh, then it's always an analogous to a situation that life faces in the lower oceanic crust here on Earth. When you have this environment, when you have, which is extremely nutrient scarce, extremely, and yet life thrives there because it has very, very uh, sophisticated evolutionary adaptations like metabolic plasticity or reusing and recycling of almost everything that it has. 
So there are ways around it, but it is of course a difficult challenge as well. And of course, there is a challenge that I probably should have bumped a little bit higher onto the list is the very low water content. We have to be aware that Venusian clouds are approximately 50 times drier than the Atacama Desert, one of the driest places on earth. So if life is indeed based on water there, let's assume that, then it would have to have adaptations for water accumulation or even maybe water production or water retention that, is, that are unlike any adaptations that life on earth has. So that is a severe, absolutely severe challenge that life, if exists, if it exists there, of course, and this is hypothetical, would have to find a solution to. And at the very end, I also uh, one of the last challenges, but, but not exactly a, a simple one, is that if anything lives in the clouds of Venus, then it would have to be strictly aerial biosphere with no direct contact with the surface. This at first might sound like it is okay, but we have to be aware that this would again force some force this, this life to have evolutionary adaptations that, that, that are quite unique. Of course, life on Earth in the atmosphere lives and, and thrives quite um, and, and adapted to it and has even a very interesting uh, specific adaptations to, for example, survive in the water droplets, uh, in the cloud droplets on Earth or even outside of the cloud droplets. But nevertheless, there is a one significant difference. The so-called life cycle, let's call it like that, of life on Earth in the clouds always, in, uh, always depends on this habitable surface of the planet. So it's our, our atmospheric life, our aerial biosphere is always intimately connected to the surface. For example, the cell division always happens on the surface of the planet and never in the clouds. So Venusian life would have to figure out how to actually actively reproduce in the clouds and how to close the cycle completely into the clouds in the atmosphere. That's something that for now, we do not have the data that happens on Earth. So where does it bring us? It brings us to the following point. And this is of course a highly hypothetical situation, the biological explanation for the phosphine production, but it is a hypothesis. But we have to be aware that if there is indeed some hypothetical life in the clouds of Venus, then, we, then it has to be life as we don't know it. Yes, because we have all these challenges that are to a degree unique challenges for, for life there in, on Venus that are not easily transferable to what we have here on Earth. So, but there is another point that I want to make here, that our detection of phosphine in the clouds of Venus is not an isolated discovery. So it's not, so we have to be aware that the detection of phosphine is only one of the list of several mysteries. It's the newest, several uh, newest uh, mystery on the list of mysteries that this planet has, because if we, for example, if we believe that if, if modeling of Professor Michael Way are correct, then it is very likely that Venus was actually a habitable world with a liquid water on the surface, liquid seas, oceans, and rivers on the surface of the planet for billions of years until as late as 700 million years ago. So we, we can ask a question hypothetically, of course, what if life originated on Venus lived there for billions of years in the habitable environment of, of the, of the, of, on the surface. And then as the planet slowly gradually uh, embarked on this road to becoming this hell that we see today, maybe, maybe this life actually found a way to survive and adapt to the only environment in the, in, on the planet that is actually conducive to life in terms of the temperature regime that, that is there. The, so the cloud decks of Venus. We don't know that, of course, but who knows? Maybe this is a possibility. That we have to be also aware that the mystery of the chemistry of the clouds of Venus is something that people are studying for, for decades. And then there's one particular chemical species that eludes us, or species in, the, in plural or singular, that eludes our research for decades. And this is the so-called mysterious, and this is even called like that in the, list, in the literature, mysterious UV absorber. There is some compound or compounds that are absorbing, that are present in the clouds of the cloud decks of Venus, in the, in the upper clouds of, 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 of Venus, around relatively where we actually see in the phosphine signal, that actually absorb 50% of all the UV light that falls onto the planet. And those are 
this sort of if you look at if you look at it those are just sort of black streaks in the atmosphere of venus in the clouds that we don't know what they are and nobody knows and what is quite people claim that there might there might be some sort of sulfur chemistry that is responsible for it but nobody really knows what's the identity of that of that particular um, absorber people of course for decades speculated rather hypothetically and uh, rather boldly that this might be sign, some sign of sign of the of the photosynthetic pigment for example of course this is highly speculative and highly highly hypothetical but it's quite important that this mysterious UV absorber is also extremely dynamic in space and time. And it, so, it, so it changes in space and it also changes in time and has some seasonal changes, for example, that we also cannot really explain. So we don't know what it is. And the phosphine discovery just adds additional layer of the myth to the mystery of these clouds of Venus. And it's not an isolated mystery because it's just adds additional one. And we hope that we will be able to solve this in some way uh, because we hope to actually go there and, and study these clouds in, in detail. Of course, where does it bring us? Well, we don't know what makes phosphine on Venus. We have no idea what chemical process is responsible for it. We cannot rule out life as a source of phosphine, but this is, of course, a hypothesis and a rather bold one. And as we, as we said, that, and, we, and we mentioned that multiple times, that we cannot, of course, favor this hypothesis over other hypotheses of unknown photochemical, uh, atmospheric, or other geological, for example, processes that we simply don't know about because, the, because Venus in general is an extremely mysterious place. But hopefully, uh, we are going to be able to shed some more uh, light on the, mist, on the chemical mysteries of the clouds of Venus because now uh, breakthrough initiatives uh, and MIT are actually teamed up together and my breakthrough initiatives uh, spo is sponsoring an MIT led study of a mission to Venus to search for signs of life and even signs of life and if, or even life itself. Uh, so it is essentially an astrobiological mission in its design in this concept study. It has, a, has a, in mind an astrobiological uh, goals um, as its core. But of course, any type of astrobiological goals are not dissimilar from the just elucidating the mysteries of the chemistry of the clouds and the atmosphere of this of this planet. And uh, yeah, I guess I will finish here. I I have to devote at least one minute to people who actually contribute who contribute. That is the is uh, probably um, not enough to say who were leaders behind this project, um, this entire endeavor. First, of course, Professor Jane Greaves from the University of Cardiff. Uh, Dr. Anita Richards from, Richards from Alma. Those are the main observers behind our behind uh, behind the phosphine discovery of uh, of Venus. There is a great uh, luck to a certain degree that our two teams uh, actually were able to find each other and have this uh, common pro have this project together. So I'm extremely grateful for that. And of course, my boss, Professor Sarah Ziegler from MIT. Her support is always always uh, great over the years, and it's a pleasure to work with her. And other spectroscopies, Clara Souza Silva uh, and uh, fantastic photochemists Sukrit Ranjan and, and Paul Rimmer. And of course, my dear friend, Dr. William Baines, who, who went painstakingly through all these chemical processes that could, could essentially uh, make phosphine and, and, uh, and, looked, if, 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 uh, looked, and looked at, uh, at many, many potential pathways that could make it. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, I, can, I can take some questions. Thank you, Janusz. That was incredible. Venus hides so many mysteries, even more. The more we know, the more questions arises. Uh, incredible words to study, and we're grateful you were able to share all the data with us. And oh, that's, uh, a, that's your a thoughts pleasure. On it. Thanks. And you have some questions on chat, uh, starting from Camille. 